Control over your own life and outcomes is the key here. If you believe, whether consciously or subconsciously, that you're not in control, you can't then claim credit for the bad or the good things that happen to you. And over time, that can chip away at your confidence and lead to feelings of helplessness and affect the way you approach challenges and opportunities, which will impact your outcomes, right? This applies in everything from compensation conversations to the opportunities that we do or don't pursue. Welcome back, rich girls and boys, to The Money with Katie Show, the show that looks at personal finance with a wider lens and dives deep into money topics that matter. This show is about the broader financial decisions and mindsets that have a major impact on your life. Let's start here. What's the difference between a victim mindset or identity and a victor mindset or identity? The crux of the difference comes down to control. Victim mindset tells you that you're not in control of your outcomes and life isn't fair, so there's no reason to try. And you might even find yourself defending your right to stay where you are, even if it's not the place you actually want to be. Maybe because there's comfort in what you know, and sometimes the resultant negative feelings of victim mentality are, while negative, the devil we know. Victor's mindset, on the other hand, acknowledges that life isn't fair, and believes that you can regain some control over your outcomes and are capable of overcoming the challenges that you're presented with. So it puts the ball back in your court. Now, control over your own life and outcomes is the key here. If you believe, whether consciously or subconsciously, that you're not in control, you can't then claim credit for the bad or the good things that happen to you. And over time, that can chip away at your confidence and lead to feelings of helplessness and affect the way you approach challenges and opportunities, which will impact your outcomes, right? This applies in everything from compensation conversations to the opportunities that we do or don't pursue. As I was writing this episode, the thing that jumped out at me was the way victim mentality can be self-reinforcing. It robs you of acknowledging and celebrating your own achievements. If you don't believe you're in control, then getting a raise at work or successfully maxing out a retirement account isn't going to feel like your achievement when it absolutely is your achievement and the direct result of your good decisions. Now, I want to make sure to distinguish here from a toxically positive perspective because I definitely think it's possible to take this too far to the point of discounting our own experiences. But the potential benefit of the victor orientation is that it positions you in the mental driver's seat. So when I was preparing for this episode, I was reading about adopting radical accountability in your work and finances, which is a practice that suggests asking when things go wrong, how am I indirectly responsible for that? Where did I miss an opportunity to communicate more clearly or to check in with somebody to assure their understanding or to be more prompt or to plan ahead more to avoid this unexpected event? And so I tried it for a few days. I tried to take radical accountability for my actions, put myself in the driver's seat. And in doing so, I noticed just how often I blame other people and circumstances for the things that don't go my way. It was eye-opening. I realized that I make excuses all the time. It was a mindset shift that was very powerful and it reoriented the way that I was approaching my life, my money, and my work. It's really easy to slip out of it though. So it requires a lot of energy and attention and intention, which is obviously challenging since most of us live most of our lives in kind of a state of drift. But anytime I found myself making an excuse for why I was overspending or why I wasn't able to do as well at something as I wanted or why I wasn't making progress with a new deal, I would pause and I would try to reframe and tell myself, you are in complete control of this outcome. If this is not going your way, what can you do to adjust? I would say you are the type of person who stays calm or gets shit done or solves problems. 
And I started to reinforce that victor identity during the points at which I would usually resort to blaming circumstance or someone else for my outcome. Now, it's possible to apply this with empathy for yourself. You can compassionately take accountability for your outcomes. You can be gentle and still hold yourself responsible for your behavior. That level of honesty with self is what paves the way for making better decisions and recognizing where we are standing in our own way, where we are making excuses for the behaviors that are holding us back from achieving the things we really want, especially financially. And we see this all the time. Maybe it's, I'm just not a good cook, so I get takeout every day without acknowledging that learning to cook is 100% in our control. And in case it wasn't obvious, I am calling myself out right now. Or I work in a field that isn't highly paid, so I don't have any options to earn more. When there are plenty of examples of people that worked in fields that are not typically highly paid, that either found other investment opportunities like real estate or small businesses, or they started side hustling to make up the difference, or they identified an opportunity in their own industry to level up. Now, here's where the conversation becomes a little more complex. We're going to shift into talking about victims, victors, and the complications of privilege in this conversation. Because whether we have a victim or victor mindset changes how we approach our money. And it's hard to talk about this without acknowledging privilege. Now, why is privilege a part of the conversation? Well, because it's difficult to acknowledge the victim mentality without recognizing its equal but opposite socioeconomic counterpart privilege. This has always been a topic that feels like playing with fire when we're talking about it on the internet in particular, because as we're probably all well aware by now, there's no room for nuance in 280 characters. Oftentimes things are binary, black and white, right and wrong, and we don't leave room for the fact that a lot of these topics are so complicated and touch so many lives in different ways that blanket statements don't really do them justice and often have us arguing from places of emotion instead of reason. I shot a Conby, the author of the book, The Awakening: Clarity, Culture, and Identity in the Web of Chaos, I will link it in the show notes, writes, victimization is a reality. Victimhood, however, is using those events to absolve yourself from the conduct you expect from everyone else. I think some people can choose an ideology or a belief system or maybe wanting to change the world because I guess it's a lot easier to want to change the world than it is to look at yourself, you know, which is why we often talk about accountability. I notice everyone is always talking about, you know, you have to be accountable, you have to be accountable. Uh, but no one ever talks about responsibility. You know, responsibility is a bit of a dirty word, mm -hmm. um, it seems to a lot of people. And, and again, because it's easier to demand accountability um, from other people than it is to take responsibility for the things that you've been through and, you know, the, the problem with victimhood and, you know, there's a very big difference between victimized and victimhood. You mm. know, victimized is something we could have all felt at different points. But victimhood is a state. It's a state. It's almost a philosophy within itself. Um, it's a way of perceiving the world um, and it comes with its own form of entitlement. And, and the funny thing is, is, you know, is the word narcissism gets a lot of flack on the Internet. And, you know, a lot of people talk about being victims of narcissistic abuse. Um, but part of narcissism is victimhood. It's the delicate balance between recognizing the very real ways in which implicit and explicit bias, prejudice, wealth inequality, and patriarchy disadvantages members of our society with the recognition that we as humans have an immense amount of resilience and capacity to overcome and change these systems for ourselves and for others. It basically means that you very well may have been victimized in your life in some way. You may have been or still are a victim, which can make this surface level discussion of victim versus victor identity more complicated. But Aishat's definition is that victimhood is the worldview that you are no longer responsible for your outcomes because of that victimization. It's the difference between the reality of victimization, which is very real, and assuming an identity around being the victim. 
And I get it. You're probably like, oh, great. Another able-bodied, neurotypical, straight, cisgendered white woman telling me to just suck it up. And I understand why conversations about victim mentality in personal finance specifically can come off a little bit funky when the person discussing it is clearly doing so from a position of privilege. And maybe that's why it's difficult to divorce conversations about money from privilege because it is so pervasive. Frankly, it's strange it doesn't come up more in the personal finance world, especially when you consider the ironies around how expensive it is to be poor in America and how wealth, once you get it, tends to perpetuate itself kind of on its own. But I was struck by Aisha's unique perspective on privilege and victim mentality. And I first heard her speak on a podcast about how social media tends to boil down very complex ideas into platitudes, which leaves very little room for discussion and understanding between people. The complexity of true privilege, true victimization, and the rich spectrum of experiences in the space between impacts the financial circumstances that we find ourselves in. Her point that most stuck with me is that reinforcing a message of victimhood to people does not help them. She basically says, you're not helping yourself or anybody else by dwelling on real or perceived victimization. In fact, you are keeping people small when you do that because you're putting them in a box with artificial limits and you're telling them that that's where they belong. And it reminded me immediately of the conversations that we've had this year that began innocently enough with an unfortunate brush with the U.S. healthcare system on my place. Um, well, I guess I should say U.S. healthcare marketplace, but then devolved rapidly into the failing child care system, the extremely expensive elder care that is inaccessible to many, the lack of affordable housing and the sweeping lack of social safety nets in America. Oh, and as if that weren't overwhelming enough, the connections between those things and our country's deeply complicated and problematic history of racism and sexism. So it's a veritable smorgasbord of unfortunate and inconvenient truths. And this is why when people instruct personal finance personalities to not be political, I beg you, how do we do that? How do we talk about money in a capitalist society without acknowledging these things? And so all of this was happening coincidentally around the same time that we were in the middle of Women's History Month. And I found myself agitated by the predictable onslaught of comments about how the wage gap is a myth and women aren't at a disadvantage in the workplace anymore, that, you know, women are equal. And I remember vehemently defending our disadvantage as women and wanting to really drive home the point to these naysayers that no, 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 as women, we are victims of the larger patriarchal system that we exist within. And when I heard Aisha speak those words, I suddenly felt this rush of guilt and panic. And I wondered, oh my God, have I done my community that's 70 to 80% female a disservice by telling them that they are disadvantaged because they're women, by reinforcing that message of victimhood upon them. Like, am I focusing on the wrong things and distracting them from the progress that could be made if we were talking in a more actionable or encouraging way instead? And I don't regret those conversations because they were genuine learning moments and they reflected real truths. And for a few weeks, it definitely felt like we were really diving deep into these social issues that matter and need to be acknowledged. But I will say, all of those conversations did not leave me feeling particularly capable. They didn't leave me feeling empowered or inspired or motivated or self-assured. They just reinforced this feeling that things are bad and man, maybe the cards really are stacked against us and maybe things are kind of hopeless. And it's dramatic to throw around the word hopeless, but that's the reality of how focusing on those things for too long and too narrowly made me feel. And I fear that it may have made some of you feel that way too. So when I heard Aisha's commentary, it really struck a chord with me and it opened my eyes to this vicious cycle of assuming the victim mentality that helps nobody overcome the very real difficulties that they've been presented with. To her point, 
it tends to keep people small by saying, yeah, you're a victim. You've got an uphill battle. Things are against you. And it's not even necessarily a commentary on whether or not that's true. It's more so the idea that even if that is true, is that the most helpful thing to say to yourself or someone else to instill the confidence needed to overcome? Or would it be more helpful to give yourself or someone else the tools they need and remind them that they are capable? It's probably the latter, right? And yes, awareness matters, but without taking action steps to improve things, the utility of that awareness is limited because make no mistake, the system is broken, but dwelling on the fact that it's broken is likely less helpful than trying to find ways to both individually navigate it and change it for those who come after us. We can simultaneously acknowledge systemic issues that need to change, and we can criticize the way that our society and capitalism as the economic backdrop for that society treats certain individuals, groups, races, and socioeconomic classes of people, while also encouraging people, including ourselves, to remember that ultimately we do have some level of ownership and agency, and that sometimes taking action can actually feel better because it puts the control back in our hands. I never want to be the person who tells you that you are destined to stay small because of some aspect of your identity or your socioeconomic status or your job choice or the amount of money you've made in the past or something that happened or is still happening to you. It's both systemic and applicable on a personal level that you can take action to improve your life. The TLDR is that the victim versus victor identity or mentality is a natural human tendency, but it affects different people differently because the society that we live in is not equal and the playing field really might not be that level. Maybe that's why it's natural, I don't know. But what I do know is that my guest today has written and spoken extensively about this topic. Dominic Cortuccio, who I originally heard speak on the Choose FI podcast in 2017, writes about intentionality and designing your life to net favorable outcomes and the sneaky ways we hinder our own progress. So I thought he might have an interesting take about how we can identify and stamp out victim mentality in our work and money. So Dom, welcome to the Money with Katie show. Thanks so much for being here. Katie, thank you for having me. And I have to thank you for selling me on the virtues of a prenuptial agreement. I'm <laughs> very much looking forward to having that conversation with my future wife. And she has any you resistance. You play the episode in the car and be like, oh, what's this? Exactly. And if she has any complaints, I'm just going to have her file it with the Money with Katie podcast. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Send it to my email. That's too good. Well, all right, perfect. So to start, I'm curious. How do you think the victim versus victor mentality impacts people's outcomes? I think there's this idea that how you think of yourself or by extension others isn't all that consequential when it comes to the hard and fast rules of personal finance and the math and all of that. But what would you say to that? Your identity, your self-concept is the single biggest driver of your behaviors in life and then therefore your outcomes that will follow. Um, and I'm relying on many different lines of research around this, but James Clear, who wrote the book Atomic Habits, which is the number one book on habits for I think the last five years or something crazy like that. He says that many of our behaviors fail because we actually just try to change our behaviors, not our identity. And maybe if I give you an example to make this real, you know, in my communities, I run masterminds of men who are looking to change certain areas of their lives. We have a number, number of men who are struggling with say weight issues, body issues. Mm. And many of these guys can absolutely go on a crash course diet, learn, learn to lose 40, 50 pounds. Like that's easy for them. They've done that a million times, mm. but inevitably, you know, they end up going back to an unhealthy weight only for them to repeat the cycle. And when we get to the bottom of it, what all of them say is deep down inside, even when they've reached their ideal weight, they still see themselves as the heavy person. Mm. Right. They still identify with the, but in here, I am not what I appear to be on the outside. And so it's only a matter of time before the late night binge or the emotional eating and, and then the cycle perpetuates itself. Wow. And so we see that pe with, you know, with financial, um, identities, money scarcity, we see that in all other areas. So 
I would say the very most important thing is who you believe yourself to be because then the thoughts follow that, the behaviors follow that, and then ultimately the outcomes follow that. I think, isn't James Clear the one that says we don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems? Yes, yes. See, I love that because I think it, it reinforces that idea of identity of you are the things that you do regularly. You learn about yourself from your own behavior. Correct. So amazing. So when we think about identity and specifically if we are consciously or subconsciously perceiving ourselves as the victim or a victim, yeah. why do you think we as humans tend to do this? Because I, I find that it's not specific to any particular group or any particular type of person. It seems like it's a pretty common tendency among people. So I'm curious why you think that is. Yeah. And I want to, I want to talk about this wrapped in a compassionate uh, umbrella here, right? Because you had said at the very beginning that the world isn't set up equally. We all have different circumstances. Sometimes the game is rigged in your favor. Sometimes the game, the, the chips are stacked against you, right? And, yeah. and, it's, and it's, a, it's a harder game for some people to play. Yep. So you ask the question, why, why do we get, you know, why does it, sometimes it even feel good to be in the victim mm -hmm. mentality. So one of the reasons why it can feel good to be in that victim mindset is sometimes you can get a lot of attention and sympathy for that, hmm. right? Now, if, you know, it's look at, so for example, I, I, I'm going through something right now. The last nine months of my life, I've been dealing with an undiagnosed physical health issue that mm -hmm basically stripped away like 70% of my ability to function. I can't work out anymore. My, oh my you know, goodness. I'm so sorry. Thank you. And look what, look what just happened. Yeah. Right? Like I'm so mm. sorry now that you get the sympathy, you get the attention. People all of a sudden are curious. Yeah. And, and, and you know that if you don't have that in other parts of your life, then that attention and that sympathy can become mm. quite addicting, right? It can feel really good because most, most people aren't getting seen. There aren't, they aren't being understood. They aren't getting the kind of attention they want. And so sometimes victim mentality can bring that on. Mm. Another reason why it can be a payoff is, and this one's a little bit more tough love, is it can allow you to abdicate responsibility for, for some of the things that maybe you have contributed to that situation, right? And there's this great question that a, a coach named Jerry Colonna, um, I heard him say this on the Tim Ferriss podcast. He said, it's always helpful to ask yourself, how am I complicit, right, mm -hmm. in creating the life circumstances that I say I don't want? Mm, oh, that's so good. <laughs> right? And, and, so, and so sometimes it's, and I'll give you a personal example from my life. Recently, I moved a third of my net worth into cryptocurrency. Oh. One week before whatever um, I, you know, the, what I invested was dropped by a third, okay? Yeah. And I could very easily have this story that starts to fuel in my mind of, I'm just not good at timing. I don't know what I'm doing with these things. You know, that kind of thing that could very easily help me to take away the, well, it's not my fault. It's intervention. It's whatever the market, the mm -hmm. game is rigged against me. And I could, I could easily allow myself to take away my responsibility in that matter. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is, it reminds me, I'm using this example earlier in the episode, but I have this story about myself that like, I'm not a cook and I'm not good at cooking. And yep. so it justifies the amount of money I spend on takeout and like prepared meals. And very rarely do I ever acknowledge that learning to cook is a hundred percent in my control. Like that I'm not a victim of the circumstance of not knowing how to cook and it's yep. not an excuse, but it, it it's like, what I tell myself to, to justify the behavior that I want to have anyway. Katie, what you just said about the story I tell myself, this is so important. If we, if we talk about like how identities get formed, mm -hmm. one of the critical ways that identities get formed is the story you tell yourself, right? And so you told yourself the story that like, I'm not a good cook and you reinforce that over time. And, and then you go and, you know, spend a lot of money on takeout. Mm -hmm. And we do that like, we do that like animals here in New York city. But, <laughs> but, but I started to notice over these last nine months of, you know, not feeling the way that I've wanted to. And I'm, you know, I'm relentless about my health and sleep mm -hmm. and what I put in my body and exercise. But I was noticing over these nine months, I was starting to tell myself the story. I'm sick. 
there's mm. something wrong with me, you know? And, and then each time I tried a new supplement, went to a new doctor, nothing would work. I kept reinforcing that story. And then every time someone would ask me about my condition, how are you doing? I would keep reinforcing that story. And all of a sudden I, I, I started to assume the identity of a sick person. And then that layered, it, it started, that was kind of like putting gasoline on the fire of what was going on. And I had to capture that, interrupt the story. Mm. And, and now I'm telling myself a new story that I'm starting to live into, which has, has actually started to turn the tides of my health a little bit. Wow, that's so amazing. It's funny because I frequently will joke about manifestation and all these like woo woo things uh, on my Instagram account for Money with Katie. And even though I can kind of make jokes about it and acknowledge like, oh, it's so woo woo. The reality is that a lot of the woo woo things that I've done have come to pass. They have come to fruition. <laughs> so I'm like, I know that this sounds a little out there, but if it's working, who am I to question it? Or who am I to like make fun of it? So you mentioned something about interrupting the story and yeah. noticing what you were doing and then deciding the new reality that you wanted to begin to live into. And I think with a lot of people, similar to your weight loss example, a lot of people with their money, I think, have these stories about themselves, whether they learned them in childhood or they learned them as young adults, as adolescents about, you know, what they're capable of earning or the type of spender they are or that they're not able to save or that they always fall back into this pattern. So how do we empower ourselves to step outside that framework or that story and build an identity that is victorious instead? Great. So, you know, you referenced that you heard, you heard me on the Choose a Five podcast in 2017. I had no yeah. idea it was that long ago, but yeah. right around that time, I wrote the book, Design Your Future. And mm. it's a book about how to stop drifting and start living. And there's this three-step process that I propose around how to do exactly what you're asking, which is to really like interrupt these limiting behaviors. And so the first step of this three-step process, and this three-step process, you can call it ADD. Um, <laughs> the A is awakening. Just this awakening to a, an awareness of, I have these limiting beliefs and these stories. Here's what I'm telling myself. And just even having awareness of that, like you can't change what you're not aware of. Mm. You bring into awareness that, oh, I'm telling myself the story I can't cook. I'm telling the story that I'm sick. I'm telling the story that I'm never going to have enough money or this is just how I was raised, oh, in, right? Wow. So when you wake up to that, you can then take the second step in the process, which is the D, the disrupting, right? And in that disrupting, what you're looking at doing is interrupting that pattern and then experimenting with new narratives. Um, a great example of this, I just had a man named Dr. John D. Martini on my podcast, which is called The Great Man Within. And Dr. G. John D. Martini is one of the like forefathers of modern personal development. He's been in the business for like 40 years. When he was 17 years old, he was a high school dropout. He was dyslexic. He couldn't read. And every teacher he ever had to basically told his parents that he, he just wasn't going to amount to much of anything. Wow. He encounters when he's you know, sitting on the shores of Oahu and he's high as a kite on all sorts of drugs. He ends up encountering a spiritual guru who takes him to a, an event, an experience where John had this vision that he was going to be speaking in front of a million people. And it scrambled his brain because you know, here's someone who couldn't even you know, like read and he's like, how could this be possible? And what the guru said to him, he said, your work every day from now on is to say to yourself, I'm a genius and I apply what I learn. Hmm. I'm a genius and I apply what I learn. Now, if anyone who's heard of affirmations, you talk about woo woo. I love to roll my eyes. Like in the past, I love to roll my eyes at, at like these kinds of things. And I said, Dr. John, do you, did you believe that when you first started saying it? He's like, no, <laughs> there was right. no evidence in my life that I was a genius. Right. I went home and I told my friends, it's my new affirmation. And they laughed in my face. That was my first, you know, support crew. And he's like, but over the course of time, after about a month of saying it, He's like, I noticed this encyclopedia on my bookshelf. And that just gives mm. you kind of like a time warp. He, he had encyclopedias. On <laughs> and he, 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 took, he pulled it off his bookshelf and he was like, I'm going to learn 30 words today. Wow. Tomorrow I'm going to learn another 30 words because I'm a genius and I apply what I learn. And he kept doing these little micro actions, just like how on Choose If I, they talk about 1% better every day, you mm -hmm. know, 
This is what he was doing. And it created this domino effect where then people were showing up to his lectures. And then in a year, he heard someone in the audience speak to another person like, man, that guy, John is a genius. Oh my gosh. First time he'd heard the word out of someone else's mouth. So he disrupted that pattern. He experimented with something new. And that last D, you know, the awakening, disrupting, the designing part. Mm -hmm. He designed a new vision, a new identity. I'm no longer the, uh, I'm no longer the, um, the boy with the broken brain. I am the genius who applies what he learns. And every action I take, no matter how small, is in alignment with that guy, not the other guy. And he ended up becoming like someone who wrote, who wrote 40 books, who's spoken in front of over a million people and uh, has impacted a lot of lives. Wow. Oh my goodness. Well, and I think the crux of that experience, him noticing the encyclopedia and being like, I'm going to, I'm going to learn 30 words. I don't know what would have happened had he not been telling himself every day that he was a genius who applied what he learns. But I have to imagine that type of affirming yourself or reinforcing to yourself who you want to be, who you are aspiring to be, um, and the types of behaviors that you want to exhibit regularly, that that predisposes you a little bit to those types of behaviors and actions and allows you to see opportunity that you maybe wouldn't have noticed before. And I think that's where kind of the, the woo-woo meets the actionable and like where that where those two intersections uh, cross. You nailed it. That's exactly right. And and one of the things that, one of the biggest ways that we form identity is through evidence, right? And mm -hmm. if you think about the evidence of someone's life where if they've never had money, if they've never made money, if they make money and then lose money, there's all this evidence. There's this compilation of evidence that I'm not good with money, that mm, I'm never going to wow. be, you know, I'm never going to be financially secure. But here's the thing about identity. Most people's identities are artifacts of the past. Right. If you mm -hmm. think about that, it's evidence, it's everything of the past, not a conscious creation of the future. So in actuality, most people are not really creating a conscious future. They're just kind of repeating what they've done in the past because they're reinforcing, they're looking for more evidence. And so what Dr. John did, you know, what I'm doing right now, what you've done with your podcast and the movement that you've created is you set a vision and it didn't exist in your life just yet, mm -hmm. but you created this vision and then every day inspired action. You show up, you accumulate evidence of this new identity. Hmm. Wow. 1% at a time. I like that. I like the evidence. So on that note, you know, living with intentionality and accumulating the evidence, designing your future. You spoke earlier about this idea of drift and you were the first person that I ever heard kind of discuss this concept in a way that really made sense that we tend to live a lot of our life in a state of drift. Like we're kind of sleepwalking a little bit. And I think this is especially true with our money because sometimes making better decisions with money means being more actively and directly involved. And a lot of the times going against the grain of what feels easy or justifiable or repeatable that, you know, we've seen the evidence from our past that this is how we are. So, can you speak a little bit for our listeners about this concept of drift? I sure can, uh, because it's one of my favorite things to talk about. And I may, go on a, <laughs> I may go on a short monologue here, Katie. So if you need to interrupt Love me at it. any point, Soliloquy please do. Soliloquy away. Please do. Uh, yeah, there you go. I'll let you drink your tea or your, co yes. your coffee. <laughs> tea? Okay. This so, is tea, but yeah. It is. Okay. There, there, yeah, there's two camps, coffee or tea, and I just need to know which one Coffee came first, tea comes second. That's oh. that's how I roll in this house. Wow, you are a new breed. <laughs> the okay. coffee is the 6 a.m. drink. The tea is the 8 a.m. drink. I respect that. All right. <laughs> so I found on the interwebs once a while ago a quote that shook me to my soul. I can't figure out who to attribute it to. It hmm. was the definition of hell. And the definition of hell is on your last day on earth, the person you became meets the person you could have become, Ooh. right? That ooh, like on your dying death, but like your last breath, this vision in front of you appears of who you, who you could have been at your fullest potential, who you could have been if you pursued, pursued your purpose, if you took mm -hmm. that risk, right? Yet instead you kind of just did what you were comfortable with. 
You did, you know, what was predictable, what was safe. And then your last breath, you see that vision of yourself that you never, that you never achieved. And then bang, you off into the afterlife. That's a scary proposition. Oh, right. So it begs the question. A lot of people end up meeting that fate and it hurts my heart. So I started getting really curious about how do we end up that way? Mm-hmm. And we all say we want to live our best lives, but then we don't. And why do, why do we end up that yeah. way? So Napoleon Hill, who is the author of Think and Grow Rich, and it's one of the most, is one of the seminal books of all time on how to attract abundance and riches into your lives. He interviewed 500 people who are the richest people in the world, downloaded their secrets, wrote the, you know, the, the proverbial Bible for attracting riches, and that was Think and Grow Rich. But he wanted to write a bookend to that, a cautionary tale about the stories of 25,000 people who he interviewed over a 20-year period of time. Think about this, 25,000 people at wow. the end of their lives. Wow. who did leave chips on the table, who did live out that definition of hell, and he wanted to find out how they ended up there. Mm-hmm. So he took those stories, he compiled it into a book, and this is the number one most important book of my life. I've probably read three or 400 books by now. And it's called Outwitting the Devil. And in this conversation with the metaphorical devil in the book, the devil says, the way I enter the minds of people is through their habits and through their habits James I can ass- clear has entered the chat <laughs> yeah, right. yeah come on in James what do you guys say about this <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and so he goes through through this habit I can establish the principle of drifting and when I get a person to drift I can lead them straight towards the gates of hell now what he means by drift is we think we are making conscious decisions in our lives that we're in control that we're in the driver's seat of our car. But in actuality, Mm -hmm. if you look at your day, the majority of it is your unconscious patterns, unconscious habits, your belief systems, your insecurities, your fears, what society tells you should do, what your parents expect you to do. And you're not in the driver's seat of your car. Oftentimes you're in the backseat or stuffed in the trunk. (laughs) (laughs) And it's only when an outside force comes in and runs you over, do you tend to wake up and say, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. And, what and am so, I doing? Where am I going? And why, yeah. why am I only now aware that I, yeah, you know, what's funny is, um, I, I was reading something the other day about in a similar vein, but not exactly the same thing where the person was, um, in, I think it's, it's a different version of AA for people who are relatives and loved ones of addicts. Al-Anon. And so it's a gr- support group for them yep. to learn, you know, mechanisms and, and how to support and cope and whatever. And the person, you know, stands up and is basically like, what if I'm already living my ideal life and I don't even know it yet? What if I already have the things that I want, but I'm like so tunnel vision on the wrong things that I'm not even allowing myself to experience the good things in my life? And I think that these things go hand in hand because it's, you know, are you are you in the driver's seat? Are you actively pursuing the path and the outcome and the life that you want? But also, are you even paying attention to see how maybe how good things already are and how much of that you've already achieved? Things might actually be a lot closer than you think to this ideal future that feels so far off. You nailed it. The single greatest power that you as a human being have is where you put your attention. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, and let's think about this for a minute. You know, I'll, I'll, use it, I'll use a story from a great book, Jane McGonigal, who wrote the book Super Better. And, um, and, and she's been on the Tim Ferriss podcast a few different times too. So she wrote this story about how in doctor's offices, the single greatest pain that a human being can experience, according to doctors, is burn victims, right? Burn victims who then have to have their whole bodies dressed and re- undressed, you know, with the wrapper and the, and the different... Um, ointments that they put on. It's an excruciating process that has to happen on a daily basis. Mm. Even with the highest dose of morphine that's legally allowed to be administered to to numb the pain, 100% of the patients experience pain. They're aware of that pain. Wow. So you try the drugs, whatever, and, and they're still feeling it. What was fascinating was a few gamers and scientific researchers developed a virtual reality game called 
I think it was called Snow World, hmm. where they, they placed the goggles on these patients, had them play this game while the doctors came in and undressed their wounds and redressed them. A shocking result came back that 93% of those patients whose attention was absorbed in the game did not feel they were unaware of the pain for the first time in their lives. Wow. And so what this study concluded was where your attention goes, your energy flows. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we need a game to absorb our attention. In other realms, people, you know, do mindfulness practices and breath work and, but when we talk about this mindset, you know, you go to victim victor mentality. If you're constantly focused on just like when I'm focused on, I'm sick, I feel weak. I can't mm -hmm. work out. I've got a headache. I can't do my work. That layers on a secondary level of suffering. You know, pain's a choice. Suffering can become, I'm sorry, pain is inevitable. Suffering can be a choice, right? Ah. Uh. <laughs> And that suffering comes from, am I going to put gasoline on the fire of all this negativity or, and, and this is stuff I started to do, Katie, I'm serious. Like I started printing out affirmations, like I'm the healthiest I've ever been. I'm getting stronger every day. I, I love that. I have pictures of myself when I'm at my healthiest and doing like lots of workouts. And I'm like, I'm going to be doing that again. I can't wait to go running in the mountains again. And now instead of being surrounded by like, doctor's meetings and supplements. I'm surrounded by these images that are uplifting and weird stuff starts to happen around like, oh, I'm sleeping better. People are coming to me with like, you know, new opportunities to, you know, enhance my mindset or yeah. see doctors that actually understand what I'm dealing with. So your attention and where you point it is the single biggest power that we ever have in our lives. My husband's going to come home from work today and there's just going to be like doctored photos of a bank account with $10 million in it all over the mirror. <laughs> Jim Carrey, Jim, Jim, Jim Carrey. I am that. very wealthy. <laughs> yeah. Jim, Jim Carrey. Have you heard that story about him? He wrote himself a check for 10 million bucks. Oh yeah. Wait, where did I, I just heard this like three days ago. That's so weird. That timing yeah. is so strange. There you go. So this is like, you know, it's like a, it's, this would reinforce this, this would be called a synchronicity in the woo woo world, Katie. Uh, that, that see, I'm learning. <laughs> and, and on, I think it was the year that he did dumb and dumber the movie Dumb and Dumber, that he ended up getting a $10 million check for that movie. Oh my God, that yeah. is insane. Yeah, yeah this, this kind of stuff has happened to me over the last you know two years or so where I'll set these like crazy goals and write them down in that like I will or I am statements. And so far all of them have come true. And I'm like, all right, I either got to start thinking bigger or like right. some, this is crazy. This is super powerful. Dom, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate your time. Katie, thank you for having me. Thanks for the laughs and uh, thanks for the questions. They're really deep and what you're doing here is amazing work. Absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that. All right, y'all. That's all for this week. And before we go, comment below what you thought the most interesting part of our conversation was. And remember to like and subscribe to our channel. I'll see you next week. Same time, same place on The Money with Katie Show. Our show is a production of Morning Brew and is produced by Nick Torres and me. Sarah Singer is our VP of Multimedia, and additional content editing comes from our lovely senior editor, Hannah Velez. Our video producers are Emily Milliron and Christy Muldoon. And last but certainly not least, Sam Cat is our Vice President of Chaos, and Jojo Beans is our Chief of Woof, barking at any passerby, regardless of how well the recording is going.